Welcome to HGCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name is Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HGCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And as HGCLA president, it's been my privilege to be part of the Reasonable Doubt show for the last year. And tonight, as moderator, this will be my last show because my presidency ends next week. So I wanted to thank each and every one of the viewers for watching every week and to encourage you to continue to watch. I also want to say that it's been my pleasure to work with everyone who works so hard to make this show a success each and every week, and I know it will be enjoying much success in the future. Because this is my last show, we wanted to have something extra special for you viewers at home, and I do not think we're going to disappoint you. Tonight, we have special guest, famed attorney, Rusty Harden. Rusty is someone who has demonstrated himself to be a man of equal flair, competence, and brilliance on both sides of the bar, whether representing a corporate company, an individual citizen accused, or, as in his prosecutorial days, a victim in Harris County, he has excelled. Rusty is someone who's represented a number of high-profile clients, including Roger Clements, Adrian Peterson, and most recently, NASCAR driver Kurt Busch, just to name a few. But what makes Rusty Harden a famed attorney who's not only well-respected in his community, but a living legend, is not his representation of all of these high-profile clients, but his recognition that each individual client in their case is the most important in each matter. And so tonight, we welcome our special guest, Rusty Harden, who will discuss this and much more with our host, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jimmy Ardwan, and welcome to another episode of Reasonable Doubt, sponsored by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. My co-host, as always, is Damon Parrish. And as Carmen said in our intro, we're really pleased tonight to have Rusty Harden as our guest. As Carmen said, he's been on several high-profile cases throughout his career, but most recently, as she said, with Adrian Peterson, Roger Clemens, and Kurt Busch, to name a few. And we're very excited to have him here tonight to answer some of our questions and tell us some of his war stories from all of his past trials. So we want you to get involved in the conversation tonight. We're going to be on Twitter, taking your questions live at HCCLA underscore TV. We'll also open up the phone lines so you can ask Rusty Harden all your questions around 8.30. The phone number's at the bottom of the screen right now, 713-807-1794. We'll take your questions right here live on the air, but right now, I wanna bring in my co-host, Damon Parrish. Damon, good evening, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. You already saw my shoulder, so here we go. Well, we get a preview of every part, body part of yours, it seems like, the last couple weeks. I'm building so. up to it. I know. Next week's a, new, a whole new surprise. I know you are, I know you are. But we're gonna keep it PG. We will, we will. And right now, I also want to bring in our special guest, <laughs> Rusty Harden. Rusty, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really? Appreciate it. Rusty, we kind of open up the show. We'll talk about a few current events and get your thoughts on them as well. And the first one I want to open up with tonight is the Baltimore police, the, the right. charging of the officers. Um, Damon, tell us a little bit about that and what, what you've uncovered in your research. Well, you know, Jimmy, Baltimore is the gift that keeps on giving. It's the flower that keeps growing. Uh, so now the defense attorneys and what we do as defense have brought forth new evidence that maybe it hasn't been laid out as uh, the prosecutor Mosley has said. Mosley has said. Um, first, they challenged the knife. You know, she said that the knife was a legal knife, which makes the stop of Freddie Gray uh, without probable cause, without reasonable suspicion, and therefore add more fuel to the fire. Well, now they're saying, hey, that knife actually was illegal. So the stop itself was a good stop. Uh, and then they go on to challenge whether or not he actually, the, the coroner ruled it as a homicide. Now that's, that's a big deal, because if it's a homicide, if, if he was killed, then obviously somebody killed him. But if it was just an accidental death, which we don't know yet, but the defense attorneys are saying that, hey, it wasn't a homicide, that also adds more fuel to the defense fire and takes away some of the, of the shine of uh, 
the, the way Mosley presented the case to the public. Right. Rusty, I want to get your thoughts because you spent 15 years as a prosecutor right here in Harris County and you actually were the head of the trial bureau. And we, we talked about in the intro about all the high profile cases you've had as a defense lawyer, but you tried several high profile cases as a prosecutor as well. And I kind of want to get your take because it seems like this prosecutor went out and made a lot of bold statements at the very beginning, some of which may have violated the disciplinary rules. It, I, it wasn't actually the trial bureau. I was a division chief. Okay. Uh, others were in charge of the trial bureau, but the principle is correct. I think it's incumbent on anybody that's in charge of the criminal justice system to not give in to public pressure and not to, to respond to the hue and cry of uh, the bloodlust, if it is, for a highly publicized event. And Baltimore has failed. Uh, the district attorney has failed, the mayor has failed. They were so intent on quelling the violence that they decided to sacrifice fairness and justice. I don't know whether there's something wrong about what happened with those, but I will tell you this, none of those police officers will be convicted because that's just a personal view. But what really, really upsets me about it is a six-day decision to file on something like that. All of y'all know that in Harris County, what would have happened is, which is what everybody nationally expected to happen, it would go before a grand jury. You know, everybody wanted to complain about Missouri, but the thing to remember about Missouri is not only were there no charges, were there, the federal government decided after they reviewed it there were no charges. So after all that hue and cry, uh, when you look at it impartially, and they're not doing it there, they made a political judgment. And when it's all over, they're going to be embarrassed. And it's wrong because there are bad police officers. Most are trying to do what's right. And I have to tell you, in, in, in the interest of full disclosure, our youngest son is a police officer, 13 right. years. So not only was I a prosecutor for 15, but I have a son that's a police officer, and I've maintained good relationships and close relationships with our police officers, though we go against them, just like you do. Sure. What's happened in Baltimore was giving in to the, to the public clamor, and it was wrong. It's morally and legally wrong. Do you think she'll be recused? Do you think that they will bring in a special prosecutor to kind of start this whole investigation over? I don't know, because what you have right now is all the politicians are jumping on board, and they're going to be embarrassed. A year from now, it's probably going to be a Duke lacrosse situation. And so I don't know whether at what time people started to back up and say, we've got a fundamental duty to do what's right. Let's look at it carefully. Nobody wants to do that. And so they're hanging these guys in a woman. There's a woman involved who, if you look at her life story, how in the hell would anybody ever be going after her for doing anything intentionally wrong or even right. negligently wrong? So I, I, I don't know whether she'll be recused, but basically what you have is, is people in elective office giving in to the public cry. And you know, Jimmy, to echo what uh, Rusty has just said, I think this is, to me, very similar to what happened in Florida with Kaylee Anthony, and you have huge public outcry, justifiably so. Death is a death, and people want answers, and it, an overreaction. You know, I think had they investigated, maybe charges should have been filed, but I don't know if the charges filed were the correct ones. Hey, and in my next life, in my next life, I'm going to come back as a guy in charge of going around and kneecapping every talking head legal expert. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start with us. <laughs> no, no. Actually, actually, you guys are asking questions. That's what people ought yeah. to do. What annoys me is these lawyers who turn on TV and give these really firm, strong opinions right. about right. None of us know what the facts were. None of us have walked in the shoes of either the accused or the victim or their lawyers or their participants. And I just get really tired of all these instant experts. Yeah, it's it, it's very troubling. And, and I know, Damon, you'll be keeping up of with all the goings on. I know Loretta Lynch, the, our brand new U.S. Attorney General, is, is starting to look into things. So she gets thrust right into the spotlight on But this. she has been very moderate and very, I, I've been impressed with the way she's dealt with it. She has visited with everyone. She has not condemned anyone. Right. She really seems to have a wait and see, let's find out what the evidence is. She seems to me, out of this entire thing, the only one who's come across as an adult. I, I, I can't agree with you more on that. And she's taken a, a very cautious wait and see approach. And, and, and we'll do the same and, and monitor everything and keep, uh, keep it going here on the show as, as new things come aboard. Week in and week out, we'll be here. The next item, current events, will help us kind of segue into, you know, a lot of the instances that you're here for to talk about tonight. But we want to get into the Tom Brady deflate gate because that is the big news Jimmy, right let's now. Let's get to some real news. That's right. Get some to the real, real news. Real legal analysis here. And so today it, it was the, the Ted Wells report was released. 
basically condemning the Patriots uh, and specifically Tom Brady for knowledge of potentially deflating footballs during the AFC Championship game. Of course, Brady and his lawyer slash agent have come out and publicly decreed the the findings and said it was a witch hunt and that you know the Wells report. What do you expect when they right. go and hire somebody? They're going to find for the NFL, of course, in the first place, but. Um, Rusty, you've been on both sides of this. You've, you've represented Adrian Peterson, um, and I, I know Adrian's still on probation, so we're not going to talk too much about the facts of that case here. But you've represented Adrian Peterson, dealt with the NFL firsthand, and you've also been part of an investigation. You're still part of an investigation into the University of Texas Board of Regents situation that's going on right now. So kind of from your perspective, does this seem like a, a witch hunt? And what, as you look at both sides of this, what are, what are the concerns that you have? You know, as a lawyer, it depends on whether you're talking about as a fan or as a lawyer. Yeah. As oh. a lawyer, I think it's much ado about nothing. <laughs> as a fan, yeah, does, is it interesting to know whether one quarterback with his balls is getting a special deal where the other quarterback is? That, that, that's, that's a different issue. I, I think the bigger issue here is our desire to make everything a legal issue in society now when something goes wrong, whether it's a crime or is it a lawsuit. You know, we make our living representing people or filing lawsuits or defending lawsuits, so I'm obviously not against that process. But now it seems like everything has to be a big freaking deal when... So what happened? So they played with the ball that was a little too light? That's wrong. And, and something should happen to them internally about it. But is it the end of the world? I don't think so. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Is it worth the millions and millions, <laughs> Thank you. And millions of dollars you know <laughs> that Roger Goodell has spent on investigating well, this. And I don't think any of us at this table are going to begrown a lawyer from making a living if, a, if an organization comes to him and says, hey, we want to pay you right. seven figures to go and investigate what happened, whether or not air was let out of footballs. But at the same time, Rusty, it, it, it kind of seems to me, it, and, and, and this kind of dovetails into what I want to ask you about Roger Clemens, later, it, maybe now is a good time, but it seems like we're making a, a big ado about things that shouldn't be made big deals in sports. In Roger Clemens's case, we showed at the trial that the federal government used 102 federal agents to investigate the issue of whether a ball player was telling the truth before Congress when he said he did not use banned substances. That's incomprehensible to me. When the trial was over, the jury said, you know, what in the world were we doing here? And and so I wanted to be there only because a public forum was the only way he was ever going to be able to challenge the allegations and, and have somebody on his side telling the other side. But in the overall scheme of society, was that a proper use of resources and whatever? It was crazy. And, it and was it, crazy. And, and, and to see? actually circle that back to what we just talked about, 102 agents for Roger Clements, and I like Roger Clements, and you know it wasn't half that for Missouri, Freddie Gray, or Baltimore, right? And which no. a better allocation of, of federal funds, a better allocation of federal time. Right. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and I want to... Staying on Clements for a while because you obviously got a great result. You got the acquittal uh, for Roger at trial in, in Washington, D.C. But you faced a lot of criticism uh, f from a lot of lawyers right here in this town. All over the country. Uh, yeah, but I mean, some of your closest friends, y you know, kind of were, were, were backstabbing yeah. you and saying, God, I can't believe yeah. Rusty's letting him get out there and yeah. do this. I mean, yeah. you had a lot of pressure on you because you, and, and they criticized you for client control and how's he going to manage this? I can't believe he's not making him take the fifth. Talk, talk about that experience. I think a lawyer's responsibility is to advise the client of what all the possibilities and ramifications are about whatever he or she chooses to do. The lawyer's responsibility is not to try to impose his or her will on the client. I think it's arrogant and wrong because the client is the only one who has to live with the consequences of what they do afterwards. The lawyer goes on to another case and if the lawyer compels the client to do what they, the lawyer, thinks is appropriate, I think it's wrong and it, and it, it augurs ill for the future of the client. But the other side of that is, is I didn't disagree with what Roger did. So I, I think it's funny when people ask me to talk. After the verdict, of not, for, for four and a half years, I was the worst lawyer in America. I mean, <laughs> I was actually emblazoned like that right. across ESPN. 
people wanted me to have my license taken the, away. The, the talking could, heads that you want to captain these, they were, they were they, out they, they were you. great. And some of them were local that I have not <laughs> forgotten. Not at this table, but some of them were local that I haven't forgotten. I can't blame them, except that you have to understand what the jury told me after was Roger Clemens, and this is important for lawyers to remember. They said, you know what? Roger Clemens was charged because he was not willing to take the fifth. And what they meant was is the sequence is very plain. From the very beginning, before Congress even gave him an offer, uh, you know, offered to have him come testify and then make clear they would command it if he didn't, Roger knew that if he testified and denied what he did, that he took these things, that he was probably going to be referred to the Department of Justice and he would probably be charged with perjury. And as he faced that decision, he says, well, what, tell me what the choice is. I said, you can take the fifth and you're safe for the rest of your life legally. Statute of limitations is run. Mm -hmm. They're not prosecuting people for using. You're safe. But everybody will believe I did it. Yeah, that's the price for taking the fifth. We give you a right and then we take it away. But you will be legally safe. He said, I can't do that. I cannot let my four sons believe I cheated to get where I did. And if I take the fifth, everybody's going to accept it privately. I'm protecting my own legal backside, but I did it. And the jury understood that. So Roger said, I don't want to testify before Congress. I don't want to go up there. Only a fool goes up there. But if the only way I can avoid it, because here were his two choices. He could take the fifth and he's safe forever. Or he could go testify and he knew as he did so that if he denied it, he probably was going to be, because I'm advising him this, I'm telling him this is what's going to happen. You go deny that you took steroids or HGH, you're going to be referred because Waxman, chairman of the committee, kind of the all-time top of my list of jerks, <laughs> Waxman is going to refer you to, Cong uh, to the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. and most prosecutors, as you all know, won't have the guts not to charge you. That's exactly what happened. So, yes, I didn't tell him not to. I advised him of the dangers. But I also agreed with what he did. How, how did it make you feel personally? Because uh, watching as an observer and hearing the discussions in the community, in the legal community here, but how did it make you feel when your colleagues and, and some of your friends are, are trashing you and calling you a, a, a horrible lawyer after all that you've accomplished? You know what? So did it hurt my feelings? Yes. <laughs> you know, right. do, you, do you wish it didn't happen? Yeah. But you know, as you all know, our obligation is to the client. And so if we've chosen a course that we think is best for the client, the devil takes the hindmost. most. That's the only choice we have. All of us want to be loved. Those of us who pick public positions like us as trial lawyers, we are the second most insecure people in the world. The most insecure are comedians, okay? <laughs> comedians, models. comedians, they, they are insecure. Trial lawyers, they're the second group because we do want to be loved. We want every jury to like us. We want the public. We want everybody to understand. But we cannot let that affect how we represent our client. And so I understood why people reacted the way they do because the, the standard view of lawyers is you make your client do what you think is right. You've got to control your client. Well, first of all, Contrary to public perception, Roger Clemens was one of the easiest going, best clients I've ever had. He followed what he thought was right, but he would listen to lawyers' advice and he would ultimately follow it. So he didn't demand to do anything. He wasn't this big, arrogant ball player. He's big, but contrary to perception, he's not arrogant. And he, and he was a great client and he just thought, I can't, I've got to risk being convicted and going to prison for 32 months, which he knew what it would be because I can't do the alternative, right. and that is make people think I did it. And Rusty, how, how, how much in awe were you just at the level of scrutiny, both private, public? I mean, having, having Roger being called to go to Congress, I mean, it, you, you've litigated a lot of cases that didn't have nearly that much press or scrutiny. How much in awe were you about that? Um, I think nervous is more than all, you know, because you, it's, it's, not your, it's, it's not your playground. If you're a lawyer here in Houston, Texas, you always want to know if you can take the show on the road, okay? I mean, can you go somewhere where you may have an accent that everybody makes fun of or, or where you're just not like one of them? And I remember uh, Mark Lanier is a friend, and Mark Lanier, we had a case together up in New Jersey, and he told me something that, that I've never forgotten. It won't play well in the North, but hopefully it plays up well in the South. 
I said, well, you know, Mark, it's going to be interesting how this New Jersey, it's Newark, a federal civil case, how they react to us. He goes, Rusty, here's what I've learned. South travels well, north does not. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I do believe that. And so whenever I talked about going to Washington, I go, really, Washington? Y'all are bothered by that? My wife and I lived there the first two years we were married. We love Washington. John Conley was found not guilty in Washington. Right. Washington is a great venue. And so I loved Washington. I loved being there. And I really thought we'd get a fair hearing and we did. Hearing, and, we did. and the thing I loved the most was they understood who Roger was without him even testifying because they got to see the testimony on video from Congress and everything. So. How much of an influence with, when dealing with Roger's case was Barry Bonds' issue and Eddie Pet, Andy Pettit's issue in that they both have admitted, convicted, or are in some way associated with actually using um, steroids? They weren't steroids. really because, because Bonds, Bonds was a, a great contrast for us. Roger is one of the least judgmental people I've ever known, so he never would say a bad word about Bonds or about Andy. Andy was a great friend. I've never to this day heard him say a bad word about Andy. Bonds showed all the effects mm -hmm. of steroids. I mean, you have to be living on Mars to right. think he wasn't doing it. Roger, everything about him was totally contrary to having used it. So we didn't really, we wanted to make sure that people who accepted all the, here's the big problem he had. Roger's problem was all of these legions of ball players who denied it forever and then turned out to have done it. Right. So you've got to figure out how to get around that. And the best way you do that is show everything about Roger, both medical records, his physical activity, other observations that are inconsistent with having done it. So they were kind of tangential, but we all knew that that was in the public's perception. The best thing about our jury, nine people had never heard of Roger Clemens, and the other three didn't like baseball. Oh. So that meant you're going to have an open-minded jury because they didn't have a dog in the hunt. We knew didn't we, we knew we didn't want to make baseball fans because everybody baseball fans just believes everybody's accused of it did it. Baseball fans are not well people, okay? Because <laughs> they are so absolutely <laughs> devoted to the statistics and the hallowed sanctity of baseball. I mean, it's like God and mother country. The integrity country, of the game. And the integrity yeah, of the game. The, that the if phrase you make, that's always thrown out there. Absolutely. If you make an allegation about a baseball player, it's, it's over. It's done. So you don't want baseball fans. Well, kudos to you for, for Vore Dyer and picking a good jury and not just <laughs> lucking <laughs> well, on 12 people. It was a challenge. Rusty, you mentioned Mark Lanier earlier, and, and, and he's a very uh, well-known, famous civil lawyer, has, has won very many, uh, a lot of big verdicts across the country. And uh, y'all also share courtside seats across from one another at the Rockets game. It's, we do. It's pretty. I didn't pretty know you well. knew that. I, well, I'm very observant. I've been I've been a couple times and seen you down there. Uh, you're hard to miss with the yellow suits and everything. Right. So. They're not yellow suits. <laughs> Maybe yellow shirts, not yellow suits. <laughs> but I thought um, you'd be a red rowdy. Right. Exactly. Um, but you're. I always describe you, when somebody asks me about you, I always say he's a lawyer. I don't pigeonhole you into the criminal defense realm as, as a lot of people try to do because you really have created a, a, a practice that goes above and beyond criminal defense and, and you really are a trial lawyer. Well, that's the way we like to think of ourselves, all of us, there are 12 of us. I've got six partners who are wonderful lawyers and, and, and every lawyer in the firm is a better lawyer than I am. They also have the advantage of being younger. All of all the lawyers in our firm uh, mostly are in their 40s. There's one or two exceptions of me included. Our practice is about 86% civil trial work. Uh, people think of us because of criminal cases because the media doesn't cover civil. So the only time they hear of us has to do with a criminal case. But you're right. You're absolutely right. I think of it as a lawyer. Uh, I, I think what lawyers and everybody has to remember, when they call the jury over, there's no difference in a civil and criminal case. The only difference in the two venues is what happens before you get there, mm -hmm. the discovery process. Mm -hmm. But when you get to trial, it's still six or 12 citizens or eight in some jurisdictions that you're trying to persuade to your point of view. And I will never quit worshiping at the altar of juries and of the experience I had in the DA's office. Uh, I'm probably the biggest cheerleader for the district attorney's office you'll ever find because that's where I learned to try cases of all different types regularly and a lot. And there's very few vehicles in the practice of law anymore where young lawyers can learn to try. So every young lawyer that comes to me and says, what should I do? Go to the, you want to be a trial lawyer? You go to the DA's office. You do it three, you can do six, you can do like I did 15 and love every minute of it. 
But whatever you do, that's the best way to learn to be a lawyer. And, and the criminal practice, as you know, has a lot more unpredictable events. The civil practice is not comfortable with the unpredictable. They've gotten spoiled by the over-discovery of everything. So they think they have to know every document, everything, everything about it. And when something unexpected happens, unlike over on the civil, criminal side where you go, oh, really? Well, yeah, well, well, let me ask you about that. The civil side goes bonkers because it, it's not predictable. So criminal practice, criminal prosecution is wonderful experience of a trial lawyer where they want to be a, a criminal defense lawyer, a civil lawyer, or both. And, and, I, and I enjoy all of it. And I give the credit really to those 15 years in the DA's office. Do you see, since you do do both, um, I mean, and I do both as well, and so I, kind of what I've seen is a, the death of the trial overall. Have, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, obviously, but it, it's no, no, been you're dramatic. Right. Tonight, tonight before I came here, I met uh, the president of Abodo uh, and, uh, and, you know, a bar association of trial lawyers. Uh, and past president, and they were going to a meeting tonight that I couldn't go because of something else. We all talked about the death of the jury trial. Uh, those of us in organizations, I mean, look, it just blows my mind that all of these business, insurance, whatever interest, interest there are that try to do away with the jury trial, who say juries are not capable of understanding stuff. And yet we let the public vote on who's president to run the free world. And we don't think those same people are capable of deciding fact situations. Right. right. And so the biggest challenge to the legal profession from a trial standpoint is preserving the jury trial. We got our first call of the night, so I want to get to our phone lines. We're opening them a little bit early this evening. Hello, welcome to HCCL Reasonable Doubt. Thanks for your call. Hi. My question is, you know, Roger Clemens was very famous for all the uh, charity and altruistic work that he did. Uh, besides being, you know, a famous baseball player, do you think that of all the athletes that were taking drugs, that they particularly picked him out to make him an example or to, you know, was there some reason that he was more of a target than some of the others? That's a good question. No, I think what it is is the death of the presumption of innocence. It, it, Roger was, had to pay the price for all the people that had been guilty and the public, particularly the baseball world's unwillingness to, to remember that not everybody is guilty of what they're accused of. And I think that in Roger's case, uh, he was never given credit for the fact all he ever did was say, I didn't do it. I mean, if you stop and think, all of that anger and hate of him and everything, it's just a guy who's accused of something saying, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just telling you I didn't do it. Right. And yet everybody pounded on him, and I think it has to do with, here's what's happened, in my view, representing periodically famous people. The idea now is if you're a famous person of public reputation, the only way the public forgives you is if you apologize and admit it. Mm -hmm. what, that's fine for those who did it. We watched with Andy Pettit, who... I think he handled it perfectly right. He used HGH a couple of times. He admitted it when he was confronted with it, and he moved on. But nobody wants to allow for what happens if, what if you didn't do it? And nobody's leaving room for the famous person of a reputation who didn't do it. And so we just lump them all together. And so when Roger, all Roger ever said was, I didn't do it. And, and, and do you think that's because the public maybe is a little bit jealous that he is so much better. Like, the only way you could get that point is if you cheat. Because if I can't do it, you can't. Do you think that's part of it? Or? Yeah, well, part of it was this guy lasted at 44, and everybody makes it sound like he kept all the... His fastball actually went down to 91 or 92. It wasn't like he kept it up there or it increased. No one ever accepted with Roger. The fact is, Roger didn't improve during the period of time he's supposed to be using steroids. His ability went down. He just got smarter about the way during that time frame of his life he pitched, etc. I think it's that Nobody, everybody wants to think that famous people have feet of clay. And so if you're a famous person and you're a person of accomplishment, there is a segment that welcomes somebody bringing you back down to earth. Right. And I think that's what happened with him. Well, and you've, I mean, Rusty, you've represented Rudy Tomjanovich, Warren Moon, Roger Clemens, as we said, Adrian Peterson, Calvin Murphy. 
And, and what you just said, and, and of course the, on the civil side you represented Victoria Osteen, but what you said um, kind of struck a chord with me because the, there's an old saying, you can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride. And that seems even to, to ring more true with celebrities because... It's totally true with celebrities. You, you, acquit, you got an acquittal for Rudy Tomjanovich. You got an acquittal for Warren Moon. You got an acquittal for Calvin Murphy. You, you exonerated Victoria Osteen, yet... Everybody you, still believes that they, they all... Did. Not everybody. Most people still... Rudy's case was dismissed. Right. Scottie Pippen's case was dismissed. It wasn't even... They didn't even have to go to trial on it. But Warren Moon told me one time, when he... It was his wife that insisted on his case be tried, not Warren, because Warren knew that even if he was found not guilty, everybody would think he did it. It was Felicia Moon that insisted on having a trial. And Warren told me one time, Rusty, even if you succeed in me being found not guilty, everybody's still going to believe I did it. And the truth is, everybody still does, or majority. In Roger Clements's case, Roger actually told Congress, I know I'll never get my reputation back, but I didn't do this. And so to save my reputation, basically, is what he's saying, I can't do something that lets people think that I'm just... I did it and I'm walking away. And I think when we get through with famous people, we have done away with the very hallowed presumption of innocence that we ask for for everybody. And I, I just think... I represented a wealthy person recently that was successful in a lawsuit, and I was quoted saying, even the wealthy deserve a fair trial. That was the case out in West Texas. Yeah. And so it was a civil case, and I think that's true. Even the famous, whether they're good people, jerks, or whatever, Everybody deserves the public waiting to hear what the evidence is before they just pound on them. We, we've got another call coming in. I want to remind everybody we have hit the 8.30 hour, so we'll be taking your calls live on the air. Numbers at the bottom of our screen, and also you can send us your questions on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. Let's get to our next call. Hello, welcome to HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. Hello. About the DPS and the... Uh, mentioned in the Chronicle this morning about the $800 million for Border Patrol work for drug, supposedly drug interdiction. Also about the DPS, when you think about the DPS, you think of the Highway Patrol, Texas Rangers, your friendly state trooper. But the last two years, uh, you have a DPS number on every prescription, uh, making patients and doctors miserable and now you have this $800 million. They don't want to answer questions. You call them up and they say, oh, we're the highway patrol. We don't know anything about your prescriptions. Uh, any opinion on this? Thank you. Thank you. Rusty, any opinion? I don't know quite where to do with that. I, I, you know, it, it's just a personal matter. I, uh, I'm not sure all that border money is a great idea, but that's a personal political view, that's not a legal yeah. issue. I don't really think I can add anything to that debate. Well, Rusty, actually, I want to bring, you know, we've talked about this and bring it full circle. You said in Baltimore, we said there was a rush to judgment, right? Uh, same thing with Missouri, you credited how they were patient with that and with Roger. What do you think is being attributed to the people, not, not politicians, not those we elect, but the general public just rushing to judgment and overreacting these situations? Okay, look, I'm on a media show. I think if you talk to most people in the local media here, and maybe even nationally that I've dealt with, I am probably the most pro-media lawyer you'll ever meet. I have never been misquoted in 40 years. I've never been misquoted. I've never had a member of the media write something that, on the record that I said was off the record. So with that caveat, I will say to you that I think CNN and the electronic media are now incredibly irresponsible. And I say the electronic media rather than the print media because everything is so instant. Mm -hmm. CNN sent in to Ferguson, Missouri, two full-time reporters constantly. I could not take a shower without hearing about that. It does not take a rocket science to figure that those who have mischief in mind can be, can be dragged to those cameras just like a moth. And now, why am I partial to, to the print media? Because it doesn't create the sense of immediacy and reaction to people that electronic media does. And so part of it is now, look, it's impossible now to get out in front of a story. When I first started representing people that had public reputations in some deal, so there was a standard deal. You get, you know, you get out in front of the story immediately. Right. You get your side out there, just like that. And then you, you go from there. 
and and you try to balance it. And with like Calvin Murphy, we were kind of successful with that. We got our side out at the beginning and then we shut up. And by the time we picked a jury, the jury had heard of it, but they were 50-50. Okay, I can take 50-50, then we'll just sort through them for the trial. Now, if somebody's, if a famous person's arrested at two in the morning now, all of the facts and, and assumptions and allegations and press conferences by law enforcement or, or, or other people are going to be there before he or she's even had a chance to hire an attorney, before he or she's had to do anything because of social media. It's out there right away. And I think it makes it incredibly difficult to ever get out in front of any story representing a public a per, a person or issue of public appearance of, of interest. I don't know what the solution is. I mean, there isn't really a solution because the only solution is to get people to back up and hold back on judgment. Right. But it, there's certainly no suppression issue you can get involved in. Well, but it's 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 impossible to deal with. And there's no playbook for you as the lawyer in, in, in no. your cases. I mean, it's it's one thing to represent somebody in a high prof profile murder cases. The book has kind of been written on how to how to represent people and manage the media in those, but your cases, they're one of a kind. I mean, well, and, and let me tell you, Roger Clemens with the Mitchell Report, that had never been done before. I, I tell you, are right. And it was broadcast across ESPN. Yeah. It was the, the story they break in soap operas, which is the test of whether it's a really big deal. If they break into soap operas, it's a really big deal. Yeah. And, and they break into all the soap operas and everything else. And the problem is, Roger, I tell people, I was wrong. I, I mishandled it at the beginning age because I was still thinking the traditional way. I was thinking, okay, you come out, you give your side. No, that wasn't good enough. He's hiding behind his lawyer, okay? So we have Roger give his side. So he did a YouTube thing. No, he didn't subject himself to questioning. And by the way, they say, if I was, if I was guilty, I'd sue somebody. So ultimately, he, he sues for, for, for defamation. And in the meantime, he subjects himself to an injury. And they go, it does Mike Wallace. So what happens? No, Mike Wallace has lost his fastball. He's too old. He didn't ask hard questions. That doesn't do it. He's got to subject himself to the media. So he, he does a press conference with 100 people, <laughs> gets legitimately concerned, upset, and walks off. He was dead. We should never have done anything. Right. So I blame myself for that because I was still thinking within the way you deal with it in the past. But the instant media attention to anybody or any issue famous now is, I don't know how to handle that anymore. I tend to think is, thank y'all. I hope y'all have a good day. We'll see you. The, here's the interesting thing for lawyers and anybody that's interested in these kind of shows to know. The courtroom is the last and only resort any longer for a famous person to defend themselves. Until a lawyer on their behalf is able to subject the, uh, the accusations to cross-examination, to challenge it, to do stuff. That jury in Roger Clemens' case, they were furious at the government for having brought those charges. The jury in the earlier the year at mistrial, they were. But that's only because there was somebody available to challenge them. But until you get to the courtroom now, there's nobody out there in the media challenging these things. And, and you're going to find on this deal we're dealing with right now, we're going to have more and more things come out about Baltimore that make people question that rush to judgment. But the problem with it is these guys and this woman are ruined in their reputations and their career, no matter what we find out. Right. right. And you know, and so, like with Adrian Peterson, and we can't go too much into it. I don't care I mean, about going into it. I want to protect you there. Uh, we, we knew about everything about his case from ESPN before we, you even were hired on, I bet. Right. I bet before you even knew who he was or he played right. for the Vikings, and I, I joke on that, we knew all about the case. So how, at that point, what, could you, what did you do or what did you decide to well, do? Well, I mean, Adrian, if he's sitting here, he was dying to go out and tell his side of it. It was lawyers like me and others that kept him doing it because these cases now take on a life of their own. It is impossible... To, to use a crude phrase, to lance the boil. It is impossible to, to improve the situation. When opinions get so formed, if the guy or woman then comes out and says, well, I didn't do it for this or that, and that nobody's listening to them and they, right. start, they start deriding them for even saying anything. So as hard as it is for the client to deal with, you just have to hunker down till you get a forum that will fairly listen to it. And unfortunately, that's just a courtroom. Just a trial. I want to circle back to our conversation about the civil and, and criminal cases and, and what you touched on and the difference being the discovery process of how you get to trial. And 
you, as you know, there's been a huge change in the discovery rules here in Texas, and you were firsthand involved in, in the case, the seminal case for that, as you were appointed special prosecutor uh, against Ken Anderson, uh, who wrongfully convicted Michael Morton, uh, and was the, the impetus for getting our, our new discovery statute in the criminal, Code of Criminal Procedure. I want to know from you, what was it like for you being a former prosecutor and one who prided himself on being ethical? What was it like for you to prosecute a, another prosecutor? Well, it wasn't easy. I knew him. We'd been on the board of the Texas District and County Attorney Association together. I had known him for 25 years. Uh, I knew most of the people involved. Obviously, I didn't know Michael Morton. Um, there was a time in the hearing in which I wrote a note to Andy Drumheller, one of the partners in our firm, who's a wonderful lawyer. And I passed him the note and said, Kane, meet me. And it's while I was questioning Ken Anderson, and I asked him, what's wrong with giving the defense what you have for them to, to be able to use to defend themselves? And he goes off on a monologue about how some defense attorney might use that stuff inappropriately to succeed in acquitting a guilty person. And he reminded me in the movie of Humphrey Bogart, as Humphrey Bogart's got the, the marbles trying to figure out who stro stole the strawberries from the kitchen mm -hmm. uh, while his whole ship is in chaos. And uh, I, I think what happened, it was hard, but what it was about was is true believing is good. I mean, there was an article one time that when I was a prosecutor that called me the true believer, and it was an accurate article. The danger is if you're a representative of the government with all the power of the government, if you let being a true believer overcome making sure the other person is fairly informed of what you have and what the evidence is so they can properly defend themselves, you run the risk of the kind of thing that happened with Michael Morton. Um, Michael Morton is, is, a, is a phenomenally interesting and good person. The way 25 years of his life was taken away, but the way he's using it positively. Um, Ken Anderson could pass a polygraph on whether he thought what he was, did was right. And that's, that's what people got to remember. It wasn't some guy in a corner, I'm going to screw this guy and doing all this. It was somebody with the power of the government believing the ends justified the means. And Rusty, what do you, do you attribute any of that to the fact that maybe he was seeking a conviction and not necessarily justice? Yes. Which is and but but as you know, both of you know, all of us know, we have the ability to fool ourselves. So if we think we're doing right, it's not a very hard deal mm -hmm. to then rationalize what we're doing in pursuit of that, and that's why the, the Michael Morton ad is a good thing, and and why and I think prosecutors around the state have been really good overall about trying to comply with it. It is we just got to remember that. Because we decided to be an assistant DA, God didn't anoint us to know the answers to everything. And, and so we've got to be sure that there are some checks on when we get a little carried away. So there was an adage, an old, old uh, phrase I've heard, and said, it's better to let 10 men go free than one guilty man go. I never understood that phrase. You know what? You answer that to me. So y'all tell me how y'all feel about it. I know I'm not supposed to ask questions, but. <laughs> it's but, open show. It's, it's, but I, anything but, goes here. Well, see, I never understood that. I'm not. So you got to balance. So I, I never, I'm not sure I endorse that. I think it's much better to say simply, we need to do everything to do that we can to make sure, you know, a, an innocent man is not convicted. I'm not, I've never been comfortable with, with the balancing act. Well, and, right. and on that note, do you think that the, the, the new Michael Morton Act goes far enough? Because as you know, in, in civil cases, you have a greater right to discovery when money is at stake than you do when your life and liberty. I think yes, but I think the difference is in civil cases, you have the criminal bar, the criminal cases invoke a lot of innocent people being bragged into it, victims. I don't. I've never liked uh, Florida's approach to criminal cases, where you can take depositions. So it means you can take a deposition of a rape victim. She in a, in a criminal case. I, I don't like that. Now maybe. I'm wrong, and maybe I don't represent enough rape right. charge people, but look, 
that woman didn't ask to be raped, and and therefore she shouldn't have to be exposed to all of that prior to trial because she's involuntarily dragged into it. A robbery victim or an eyewitness, they didn't ask to be there. So they really, because they were standing on a street corner one day and, and it wasn't their fault and they saw something happen, they got to be... I, I think they were dragged in. I think you can go too far in discovery in a criminal case. It's unnecessary. It's unfair to the involuntary participants. So it's a balancing act. So you give the accused and his lawyers everything the government has as evidence. And then you go have a trial or if you've done it, you, or you decide whether to plea. But I don't want to go too far on discovery on criminal cases. Well, so to play devil's advocate, we have a caller. Yeah, we go. All right. So to play devil's advocate with you, uh, don't do you not believe that a an accused in defending his freedom should be able to go beyond whatever the government has as evidence? I mean, if if the if taking the deposition of that rape victim uh, discovers that she really wasn't a rape victim, doesn't that in fact? Um, Vindicate the right of the defendant to go have a little bit more discovery than, than what the government has available? Yes. I may be wrong. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, yes, I think that's a very valid point. I, I guess what I'm bothered by, I mean, that can be sorted out at trial. It may be that's the price that has to be paid because, because for, the, for the defendant that didn't do it that goes through that. You got to balance those that did and his opportunity to ab abuse and intimidate the victim. So if I've got to choose, I would rather choose that be played out in a trial, an adversarial trial, rather than a bunch of pretrial discovery that potentially could abuse the unwilling victim. You know, Rusty, you're a better trial attorney than most, so I guess you can you can rest on those laurels. <laughs> no. Well, let's get to the phones and take our next call. Hello, welcome to HC Silly Reasonable Doubt. Thanks for calling. Yes, Anna Nicole Smith. Was she <laughs> yes. such a litigious person? Was she smart about the law? I'll hang up. No, what she was, was she had a lot of street smarts. She didn't have a lot of education. She was always reminding me, Rusty, I only have a seventh grade education. But then when she got would get cornered or, or really in an awkward spot, she would show she was not unintelligent. She was not educated well. Uh, Anna Nicole... Uh, the jury, you have to remember, in our trial, there were four alternates. There were 16 jurors, 13 women, three men. The Pettit jury ended up being nine women mm -hmm. and three men. Uh, they just thought, finally, that she treated him very badly and they were not very sympathetic to her. We, got, we actually have a Twitter yeah, question. We got a few of them coming from, in here. And, I, and I'm going to quote, I haven't been quoting, I'm going to quote this one from Paul Kennedy. Thank you, sir. Uh, Paul asks, why judges in civil cases are more diligent in their gatekeeping role regarding scientific evidence? And do you believe that to be the uh, case? I think he's right. And I think it's because the courts have been putting more and more pressure, not pressure, but have been coming out with more and more opinions as to ju against junk scientists, science. And, uh, you know, there's been this trend, we did this switch, where an expert witness is just God. And so if you want to say you're an expert, you come in and you get to testify about it. And the courts have increasingly realized that you end up with a lot of junk science like that, that the jury doesn't have the background to be able to sort through unless you come in with other junk science people or anti-junk science people. So I, I think they've been cutting back on uh, that, and I'm not sure I disagree with it. So do you think civil judges are actually learning from uh, case law and being a better gatekeeper than criminal court judges? No, I think... Civil judges do not think the consequences of their wrong decision could be as bad as criminal judges are afraid on the criminal side. I actually think both of them are right. I think civil judges are making it, realizing they're making decisions about people over money or property and things like that, but somebody's not potentially going to go spend life in prison. The criminal judge, I think, is naturally inclined to say, which is my view of trying cases, let it all come in. The, 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 the kitchen sink, everything comes in because the stakes are too high to take a chance on preventing somebody having their day in court. We got another question coming in from our common friend, Mary Flood, former Chronicle writer, and she wants to know, she, talk, she talks about the energy case that you've just won several energy civil cases, and she asks, are those fights more challenging or as challenging as the criminal cases? Different stakes, money versus freedom. Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I find the civil law presents more legal challenges, and so intellectually, a lot of times, it can be more interesting. The criminal law gets us where we live. 
and it, 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 it deals with more basic human issues. Um, I think that I love the mixture, okay? I don't think I want to be exclusively one or the other because one day you're, you're, you're trying to protect or vindicate the rights of, of somebody or whose freedom is at stake. And the other day, you're trying to vindicate the, the economic status or the vindication of their position, which they believe to be very strong and morally. I find that civil clients have every much as interest in being vindicated as, criminal, as, as those in the criminal courts. They just don't have the stakes at issue. So they're walking out of the courtroom. Right? They're walking out of the courtroom. That's Regardless. Right. Exactly. Win or lose. They may not exactly. be driving their Porsche home, but they're still walking yeah. out. Exactly. Um, but many of the issues involved uh, mean as much to one as the other. I think growing up in the criminal system was a tremendous benefit to me because I was used to lawsuits over principle, where a victim says, I don't care if I win, this case is won or lost, I want my day in court. And over on the civil side, sometimes they're kind of uncomfortable with that because they've elevated the sense of rationality to the highest level, and they don't quite understand about somebody wanting to vindicate their own position. They want to talk about whether well, it makes economic sense. They make mm -hmm. well, no, no, it doesn't. But sometimes citizens want vindication of what their position and their conduct was, no matter whether it makes economic sense to spend all that money in pursuit of it. That's a long way of saying I don't know the answer to a question. Well, well Rusty, do you, <laughs> do you think people are trading in personal pride for economic uh, efficiency? Is that kind of what you're saying? No. I think, I think what happens over on the civil side is I think we give too short shrift to people who, who want what they did to be vindicated, on whether they're the defendant or the plaintiff. I mean, there are bad lawsuits brought, and so therefore the defendant wants it vindicated. There are good lawsuits brought, and the plaintiff wants it vindicated. I think... I guess my biggest regret is, is that the legal system has somehow relegated the idea of a jury trial as to a bother that doesn't make rational sense. And so they want to send you off to mediate. It is as if the civil system says there is no right or wrong. There's always in the middle. And I grew up, that's why I love coming from the criminal system, where there is a right or wrong. This guy was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. This guy didn't do it. You shouldn't punish him. But in the civil system, everybody thinks everything is negotiable. Everything can be worked out. And there's a poor citizen sitting out there saying, you know what, you SOB, you sued me for something I didn't do. And I should be able to have a trial that shows that. Or you, you harmed me and you deny you did it and you've come up with all these defenses and they're BS. I should have my day in court. I like the criminal systems version better. So do you attribute a let's lot of... Let's have a trial. Let's, have, let's fight it out, right? Let's have a trial. That's what the courtroom was created for. So do you attribute a lot of your success then to that kind of nature you speak of where it's just, no, no negotiation, let's go all or nothing? No. Whatever success I have, I, I create, it's about 75% luck. The other 25% has to do with growing up in a small town with two parents who were wonderful and going to public school until the last three years of my high school and growing up around a incredible cross-section of people that made me feel comfortable with wherever they come from. When I, when I, I had a trial out in West Texas in August or July or whatever, 9,000 people, Brownfield, Texas. The only difference in Brownfield, Texas and Monroe, North Carolina, where I grew up is, is Brownfield was flat and barren, and where I grew up was North Carolina and hilly. But the people were the same, the attitudes were the same, and the view of life and what's fair was the same. And I have been lucky enough to be able to make my living the last 40 years asking people to do what's fair or right. Sometimes they agree with me, sometimes they don't. Any lawyer that tells you he always wins, it's like my mother used to say when they, son, when they talk talking to you about their religion, get your wallet and get the hell out of that room. <laughs> we have one other question on Twitter from another viewer, Elizabeth Holt. Uh, she asks, who is the most difficult client you've represented and why? <laughs> you there's can nobody to invoke the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, right? you can yeah. The no, no, no. I've been, get really, ahead of it. <laughs> I've been really, really lucky. Uh, I have fired some clients. I have fired one or two or three, maybe more difficult clients. 
We fire people who lie to us because mm. our credibility is at issue. I, I, Life's too short to represent right. it, 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 lie to you. It, and I've said life is too short to represent jerks, but I define jerks not in based on whether they did something wrong or not, but, but how they act and they are as a person. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of nice people who do things wrong. Or there are a lot of people you and I, all three of us would like that have done something they shouldn't have done. Right. But there is a limit. And um, I would never talk about the most difficult client. So my official position is, with only the sake of one person, I, I've loved all of my clients. I, I want to get this in because we only have a couple minutes left. And, and I, did, I did a little background on you. I did some emailing and I emailed... Mm -hmm. Uh, a friend of mine who works for you, Derek Hollingsworth, and he, he sent me a couple factoids about you. <laughs> and he said... He's a great lawyer. Oh, I, I know he is. <laughs> He's a great uh, lawyer. He's Make great, sure he has a job well. tomorrow with whatever you Right. Wants. Well, he said, he said you lied to get into the military so you could fight in Vietnam. Well, he's half right. I lied to get into the military so I could go serve. I wasn't chomping at the bit to fight in Vietnam, but I was feeling guilty about the fact that I had a deferment because I was a school teacher. This is back in the mid-60s. And so people of my generation were going over there and getting shot who didn't have a, a deferment. So uh, I, I cheated on the eye exam. My military records still show I have 20-20 vision. I've got no vision in the right and 2200 in the left. And, uh, but I, uh, it wasn't necessarily that I was chomping to go fight, but I felt guilty staying out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one one last factoid that he sent me because we only have a minute left or so, but he did say your favorite color is yellow, and you definitely know that when you visit our firm. So <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm assuming that the, the office, the walls are all yellow, the everything, the furniture. Yeah, look, when I was in the DA's office, I almost wore a tan suit. Yeah, no. Well, here's how that happened. When I was a prosecutor, I didn't. I was trying to fight against the natural perception of prosecutors, so I didn't want to pe people think of us as. It's sort of automatons who were dreaming to bed, going to bed at night, dreaming about putting people in the pen. And then I thought, if I'm trying to talk people to be comfortable with me and talking to me, why would I dress formally, which is navy blue, dark blue? Right. So I used to give talks and said, how many of y'all at trial wear navy blue or dark blue? They always wear their hands. So, well, how many of you wear those colors anywhere else except when you go to a wedding or a funeral? And there were no hands. So why would you dress that way if you want strangers to come in and sit down and start talking to you? Well, now I'm captive of that because it's been written so much that I'm afraid that if I wore Navy... <laughs> Anyway. Well, we got to wrap things up now. And, and uh, Rusty, I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I, I really hope you'll come on again sometime because I've just found it to be a great time and a fascinating conversation. I've enjoyed it. We it really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you both. Absolutely. And thank you all for watching. Thank you for your questions on Twitter. Thank you for all your phone calls, as usual. We're going to be off next week, but we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new season of Reasonable Doubt right here on Houston Media Source. So tune in on May 21st for our new season. Thank you very much. Good night. Carmen, we love you. Good job. Well, I'm sorry.